All this new talk of Steam hardware has me very excited for the future of PC gaming. Not only because this first party kit will act as a baseline for new games to target for years to come, but also because these devices ship as Linux first machines. And I anticipate the Steam machines are going to sell very well if Valve can get the pricing right. So I thought it would be a useful exercise to look back at where Linux gaming started so we can understand just how far we've come. The early days of Linux saw some commercial titles come to market. An official build of Doom was perhaps the first retail title with out-of-the-box support for Linux. The Linux Doom README file said, quote, I did this because Linux gives me a woody. It doesn't generate revenue. Please don't call or write us with bug reports. They cost us money, and I sort of get ragged on for wasting time on Unix ports anyway. David D. Taylor, id Software. Foreshadowing? <laughs> Unreal Tournament 1999 and 2024 also supported Linux, as did a few other remarkable titles. And then there were a few uh, commercial ports handled by Loki Entertainment. Games like SimCity 3000, Quake 3 Arena, and Railroad Tycoon 2 being a few standouts. But most other games didn't support Linux, and the absence of Linux native games over the next decade or so spoke volumes. Linux was just too niche. But the real start of the Linux gaming era rang in in a modest and unassuming inauguration. Maybe I'm the weird one, but I actually didn't have a Steam account for a very long time. Now you might be asking, why? Well, when Steam first released, I hated the idea of buying a product that I didn't physically own. And spoiler alert, I still do. But also because Steam seemed like it was something that was only for online gamers, meaning not me. And besides, by the time Steam was really catching on and it had games that I actually cared about playing, I was already a dedicated full-time Linux user. And the thing is, in my heart of hearts, I've always been a PC gamer. I grew up playing games like SimCity or Command & Conquer or Unreal Tournament and many, many others. But because I was a Linux user, many games were out of my reach and I was okay with that. Perhaps it was my austere, hyper-religious upbringing which made me okay with not to mention derive pleasure from being an outsider. No matter the reason, I had given up most of my PC gaming habit because Linux was more important to me. There just weren't that many native Linux games and wine was too much of a hassle for me. But that all changed when the humble indie bundle number two dropped in 2010. You better believe that I snapped that up immediately. It wasn't that I was a huge fan of every game in the bundle. I mean, Braid was the only game that in the bundle that I had even heard of. But I just wanted to vote with my wallet, even though I hate that term, and support games that supported Linux. Over the next few years, the humble indie bundles were instrumental in legitimizing Linux gaming, and I built a library of Linux-compatible, DRM-free games. Then, in 2012, Valve announced the Steam for Linux beta. On August 1st, 2012, Valve posted an article on their Linux blog called Faster Zombies. To me, this was the 95 thesis. I mean, this was the Boston Tea Party. This was Valve, PC gaming incarnate, rejecting Windows and proclaiming to the world a bright, open future of computing. Valve's efforts to port Left 4 Dead 2 to Linux resulted in something they weren't expecting. They ported Left 4 Dead 2 to Linux using OpenGL, and they were able to achieve higher frame rates, 315 FPS in-game, compared to uh, the Windows build, which ran at 270 FPS. Even after tweaking, Windows simply never achieved the same level of performance as Linux could on comparable hardware. This article convinced me that Linux gaming was the future, not that it was a difficult task at all. And it was around this time that I created my Steam account. Consequently, I redeemed the Steam keys that I had received from my humble purchases over the years, and then my Steam library was nearly 100% Linux compatible Though I do have to mention that some of the Humble Indie Bundle games did not have their native Linux builds on Steam at the time. In September of 2013, Gabe Newell walked out on stage at LinuxCon in New Orleans and declared that Linux and open source are the future of PC gaming. Comparing his talk to going to Rome and teaching Catholicism to the Pope, Gabe's 23-minute talk covered many of the challenges of open source development, but also why they believe free software will fundamentally change the gaming ecosystem. Now, while the audience in attendance there were nodding in agreement, the rest of the industry was not just skeptical, but downright hostile to the idea. 
Little did anyone know that the future of gaming would take about a decade to coalesce and make good on Gaben's promise. Then came the Steam Machines. When Valve launched their Steam Machine program in 2014, Linux was unequivocally not ready for prime time. I mean, I was a Linux gamer, and I truly believed that Linux was the future of PC gaming. I have a storied, decade-plus-long career of cheerleading for Tux-flavored play. However, their initial stab at Steam Machines failed in spectacular fashion, and this only served to arm misguided Windows fanboys with piss and snark for the next 10 years. But why did Steam Machines fail the first time around? It wasn't because Windows was better, it was because the legwork to deliver a premium Linux gaming experience hadn't even been started. Now, along with the announcement of Steam Machines, Valve also delivered Steam OS. It was based on Debian, of all things. And don't get me wrong, SteamOS was a critical piece of Linux gaming infrastructure, but it just wasn't enough. At that point, the idea of a Linux-powered gaming-centric operating system was not new, per se, but before SteamOS, the available Linux gaming distros were focused on free and open source games, or emulation, or playing your Windows games through Wine. Importantly, they were developed by the community, not by corporations. See, the problem is, the biggest impedance to Linux gaming was when SteamOS launched, there was no such thing as Proton. This meant that the only games that you could play on SteamOS were native Linux games. Now, of course, folks could have juggled a Linux install of Steam for their native library and had a Windows Steam client installed through Wine to play Windows games. And if that sounds like a massive headache, that's because it absolutely was. But it was also well out of reach for a Linux novice. And if you were running the Windows version through Wine and you bought a game, that would count as a sale towards the Windows version of the game and not any potential Linux version. Suffice it to say that, at the time, gaming through Wine on SteamOS required some extra expert hustle on the part of the user, and that was absurd to expect from any user looking for a console-like experience. Maybe this was on purpose, though. I mean, perhaps Valve wanted native Linux games. After all, that was the prevailing sentiment among many existing Linux users. As the saying went, no tux, no bucks. Perhaps it was the fact that Valve was in their lethargy era. They sat at the top of the PC gaming pile, making money hand over fist, but couldn't be bothered to do the hard work. They hadn't released a game in years, they handed off the flagship Steam Machine to Alienware. Heck, they couldn't even moderate their own store, so god forbid they had to take up the mantle of managing SteamOS and an in-house build of wine. But this meant that a developer, a studio, or a publisher would have to explicitly create custom builds of their games for SteamOS. While there were a few publishers like 2K or Square Enix that were half-heartedly on board with Valve's vision of a Linux-powered future, most big publishers were not so keen. This resulted in less than one-third of Steam's catalog being accessible on SteamOS. Most of the available titles were indies at that, and most of those were from the Humble Bundles. And that was just when SteamOS first launched. As the number of games on Steam skyrocketed, the ratio of native Linux versus Windows-only titles diminished over time. And given Valve's commitment to the buy once, play anywhere philosophy of Steam play, there was virtually no financial incentive for developers to start publishing their games on Linux. There's that foreshadowing coming back around. This hamstrung adoption, and Linux gaming was stuck spinning its wheels. I mean, after all, if we can't convince the diehards to forego not 0.8% of their Steam library that's locked behind kernel-level anti-cheat, asking folks to abandon two-thirds of their library or more was an absolute non-starter. It was clear that something had to be done. About seven years ago, Valve took matters into their own hands by announcing Steam Play 2.0. This was the proper introduction of Proton. Now stop me if you've heard this one before. Proton is a fork of Wine, and Wine translates Windows API calls and system kernel calls to Linux. In many instances, this results in a Windows stack that's actually faster and more performant than the genuine article. In practice, Proton was a solution for the native Linux gaming problem. Instead of asking devs and publishers to do all the hard work of porting individual titles over to Linux, Valve said, we got it. Proton was a big deal because it meant that suddenly, some Windows-only titles were now playable on Linux. 
When Proton launched, there were only 27 officially supported games that had been whitelisted by Valve. These were titles that the Proton team had tested to ensure that they worked. Games like Doom 2016, Quake, and Star Wars Battlefront 2 were on the list. Then, when logging into your Steam account on Linux, these 27 games just worked. Valve said that they would be adding more games to this list over time, but that never really materialized. Instead, there was a checkbox in the settings that read something like, Enable Steam Play for all titles. And it was up to the community to do the testing and configuration. That's when ProtonDB appeared, which is still a terrific resource to this day. In a move that would go on to define Valve's partnership mentality with open source projects, Valve struck a deal with Codeweavers. Codeweavers are the company behind Crossover, a translation layer that brings Windows applications to Linux and Mac OS. But you might be more familiar with Crossover's sister project, the free and open source Wine translation layer. According to Codeweavers, quote, 95% of the Wine code base we develop for Crossover gets released back into the Wine project for the open source community. Valve saw the work that Codeweavers was doing, and when they decided to fork Wine to create Proton, they hired Codeweavers to help. Critically, like Wine, Proton is open source, and it's a partnership between Valve, Codeweavers, and other FOSS developers. Suddenly, Steam had a fledgling solution capable of running many Windows games on Linux. Now, Valve created a way for Steam to launch games through Proton, but this was actually generic enough that the community was able to step in and add their own Steam Play compatibility tools. Open source offerings like Luxtrapeta, Roberta, and others arose to add new functionality and flexibility to your Steam library. I have videos about that up here. In the intervening years, Valve has either hired on or contracted open source developers to improve the free and open source code that they rely on. From Linux kernel engineers, Vulkan specialists, desktop environment developers, and many others, the aim here being to further the development, optimization, and improvement of the Linux gaming experience. And the code that Valve is paying for? It goes right back into the free software ecosystem. And that focus on free software is what laid the groundwork for Valve's next project. In 2021, Valve announced the Steam Deck, a handheld PC slated to ship with a new yet unreleased version of SteamOS. This new Linux gaming OS took its cues from Chimera, a community-run Linux gaming OS from developer Alcazar. I have an interview with him on my website. Being based on Arch Linux, SteamOS 3.0 had the latest software and kernel improvements. This also meant that it was much more flexible and responsive to the needs of the hardware. Codenamed Hollow, SteamOS 3.0 shipped as a purpose-built image on the Steam Deck in early 2022, and the results here were impressive. Given that Valve not only designed the hardware, but the software in tandem, it was a synergistic boon for software performance on what some at the time decried as obsolete hardware. Compared to the Steam machines of yore, this time around, the public's reception to the deck was largely positive. There were still some skeptics. I recall Norm from Tested being a particular Windows holdout. But when the device landed in reviewers' hands, everybody saw the device as the revolutionary experience that Gabe had promised 10 years prior. Over the following two years, Valve continued updating the software, adding features, and working on an OLED model with a few new hardware tricks up its sleeve like Wake on Bluetooth. When the Steam Deck launched, HDR simply wasn't a thing on Linux. Now, my Chimera OS-based custom-built Steam machine is able to play Tetris Effect Connected, Spider-Man Miles Morales, and Doom Eternal in 4K, HDR, 60 FPS. We've come such a long way. 13 years ago, Steam landed on Linux with only a handful of playable titles. 10 years ago, Steam machines failed to make the impression they should have. 7 years ago, Proton changed the landscape. And just three years ago, the Steam Deck swayed hearts and minds. And the public perception of SteamOS has got to the point where Valve's official announcement video has nearly 4 million views. And Digital Foundry's Steam Machine video is now one of their most viewed videos of the year. The Steam Deck was huge. The Steam Machine could be even bigger. And I think it's time that Gabe Newell's promise comes to fruition.